Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. I recently polled a group of Namibian youth as to where they primarily accessed their news and information. The answer was that social media topped the list. Facebook, WhatsApp, and Twitter, followed by print, then radio and television. But on my question as to what they trusted most, print came up trumps. My discussion with the young people also told me that, despite the skepticism about social media and the often questionable content which they access there, they would continue to access these sources, primarily because buying and reading newspapers seemed like a lot of trouble in comparison. I was immediately transported back to the heyday to the, of the 80s uh, of what became known as the guerrilla typewriters. They were called such not because they took up arms against apartheid South Africa or other draconian regimes, but because they rejected government propaganda and strove for independent news and independent media. It seemed appropriate to take the youth back to when this had all started, to a time in the lives of people who had access to information and could only access the traditional or the legacy media. It was a time when entire newspapers sold out and when being a journalist was still revered as a sacred trust. Back then, Namibia was still at war for its freedom and its independence. Mobile phones and the internet weren't yet in existence, and legacy media were predominantly under the control of the colonizers. Our struggle was not unique. It was, and still is, mirrored in other parts of the continent and the world in places where authoritarian regimes control what people read, listen to, speak, and even say. The guerrilla typewriters of the 80s and the 90s were voices of independent African journalism, and they were ethical and usually served the public interest. They were brought together in 1991 in the Namibian capital of Vintuk, thanks to UNESCO, where they formulated a declaration which called for the promotion of free, independent, and pluralistic media. And the UN went on to actually acknowledge this as World Press Freedom Day on May 3. As I spoke to the young people, I looked at their faces. They sat there with their mobile phones, posting or tweeting, perhaps about what I said, perhaps about something completely different. The digital era that had dawned had come along with a promise of infinite supply of information and depth and diversity of content, greater interactri interactivity, and empowerment for vast numbers of people. But it was clear that they were both caught up in and confused in the digital tsunami. Many of these youth were unwilling some were unable to distinguish fact from fiction, information from disinformation, and everything that they share, produce, and access on social media on a daily basis. The lies and the propaganda that is often there, and even the fake news, although I really dislike that term, isn't anything new. It has been there for a long time, it is just more prolific in the era of the internet. I was encouraged by the fact that print still seems to have the highest level of trust, although, of course, it doesn't have the penetration of the internet. I had been one of those guerrilla typewriters, I told the group, as I held my omnipresent notebook aloft to prove my point. The best tool, I said, for documentation and verification to those of us to whom journalism is both a passion and a calling. Many of those listening probably believed that the digital era has sounded the death knell for journalists and traditional media and those they may see 
as the dinosaurs of journalism like myself. I tried to convince them otherwise. Instead, I said, it was of absolute importance, crucial importance, that journalists today must neither give up nor give in. They should withstand the temptation to become demoralized on the one hand, or to feed the frenzy of mindless infotainment and disinformation on the other. Instead, they should strive ever harder to be sources of credible news and information online and offline. It is they who should help ensure that the internet is not primarily used to stifle the very democracy it promises. High standards of professionalism, self-regulation, and adherence to journalistic standards are vital to win the public trust as well as informed comment. I reminded the youth that many committed journalists the world over were making huge sacrifices, some paying the ultimate price for simply doing their job. It is important that they have our support, and we should not therefore lose faith in the service that professional journalism can provide. They also do so in the face of terrible oppression. The new role for audiences, and the youth in particular, I felt, and I told them, was to rise to the challenge of promoting digital integrity, to minimize what may be called bullshit receptivity, and in the process, to increase public trust in legitimate sources of information. I impressed upon them the importance of governments, too, having a key role in refraining from contributing to a toxic information environment. This includes a commitment to a free and open online community, and it also means that those regimes or those culprit regimes should refrain from escalating attacks on internet freedom expression by restricting and switching off the internet and thereby denying access. I told my young audience they should be proud that Namibia had led the way in Africa in acknowledging the importance of a free, independent, and pluralistic press. But they should also be concerned that our country, so progressive in many other respects, now lags behind as far as other issues such as the right to information and the law to provide such access is concerned. I talked to them about the campaign for ATI legislation, which in Namibia is headed by the Action Coalition, a group of developmental, research, and media organizations, which has also worked very closely with our Ministry of uh, Information Communication Technology in order to forge a very progressive bill. But regrettably, the government is lagging, its feet, it, uh, and is lagging on this issue and dragging its feet, as are so many other governments in the region and further afield. ATI laws, it is very important because there are several of them in Africa, 22 I think, must have substance. They cannot simply be meaningless pieces of paper which are put there to satisfy political ends. Why should any of this matter to them? I asked the youth. And then I answered my own question. Because the rights-based campaigns, whether it is for freedom of expression or the right to know, are not just about the media. They are for everyone. Citizens need to and trust and take ownership of these campaigns before it is too late. Democracy shouldn't be taken for granted where it exists. It is a very fragile thing. The, the group themselves were very familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals, and I tried to impress upon them the important, how important it was for governments which wanted to achieve any or all of these goals to put in place an enabling environment in which an open and transparent regime would be in place for all media. SDG 16, which basically promotes inclusivity and accountability, 
could perhaps be called the transformational SDG, because none of the other noble goals can really happen without it. Among its targets, there is a call for countries to ensure public access to information and protect fundamental freedoms, to respect and to promote press freedom and to be champions of ATI laws is of vital importance for these states to do and also to ensure their rigorous implementation. If we can conquer the forces that stifle free expression and access and empower people to want to search out verifiable information and knowledge, then it is half the battle won for sustainable development. The struggle is still upon us, the youth most of all, and most importantly, to free our minds through knowledge. And journalists must get back to the front, forefront and in greater numbers, reviving, if they can, the spirit of the guerrilla typewriters. There never has been a more important time for incisive and committed, and yes, also advocacy media and advo professional journalism to verify facts, to dig deeper, to stimulate and to feed the public appetite for quality news and information that can be used to make a better life for all. And to have and to use the right to information laws to do the best charts they can. The guerrilla typewriters put press freedom on the African agenda when they met in Vintuk to call on governments to put in place a conducive environment for the enablement of media to freely inform and therefore empower citizenry. That call is still of paramount importance today. Good journalism, speaking truth to power, is indispensable in the global campaign for access to information. We must, I concluded when speaking to those same youth, bring back the spirit that embodied the guerrilla typewriters. This time, not just among journalists themselves, but among all producers and consumers of information across the board. In other words, everyone. Then, and only then, will the world be able to take up and rise to the challenge to build knowledge-based societies and rights-based societies. I think, I hope, I got some of those youth to get on board. The future depends on them. I thank you.